Hello and good day everyone. So in this video, we will be discussing about seismic based shear computation using static force procedure. So before anything else, one major role of a structural engineer when designing is that the engineer must first anticipate all of the loads, may that be environmental or man-made, in order for him to design a structure that can withstand the anticipated loads. So one environmental load of vital importance, especially in earthquake-prone countries just like the Philippines, is of course the seismic loads or the earthquake loads itself. Okay, so in seismic loading or in earthquake loads, of course, as you know, when there is, I mean, if there are earthquakes, the ground will be shaking. So the energy of ground shaking will now be transferred onto the structure in, um, in a way of what we would be calling a force called base shear. So the base shear is a force or a horizontal force that will be acting on the ground level itself. So let's say that this is now the base shear. So let's say that this is the base shear. And once again, it will be located on the ground level itself. So let's say that this is now base shear V. So V and that is now our base shear. Okay, so if... For example, that this base shear will now be acting on this level, every floor will now be resisting this base shear. And these are what we would be calling our story shears. Okay, so all of these arrows on the right are what we would be calling the story shear. So I will just be writing them here first. So story shear. Okay, so it may not visually represent it correctly, but if you would be adding all of the story shears, they must be equal to the base shear. So once again, all of these are the reactions per story to resist the base shear. Okay, so according to the structural code or the NSCP or the National Structural Code of the Philippines, so we can design structures to resist earthquake lateral loads using these three methods. Okay, so namely, we have the static force procedure and as per the name of the title says, this is the main coverage or the main topic for today's video. The next, you also have the simplified static procedure and as per the name itself says, it is basically static but simplified. So you can only make use of this um, procedure if, let's say, one of the criteria will be satisfied. So just go to chapter 208.4.8.1 in the National Structural Code of the Philippines. So next, we also have the dynamic lateral force procedure of section 208.5.3. And this procedure is an advanced topic that is commonly used in high-rise structures or let's say is used in buildings with plenty of irregularities as follows. So I will be leaving the reading part to you. And once again, in today's video, we will be discussing about static force procedure. So static first procedure is, I mean, can be seen or the formulas can be seen in uh, section 208.5.2.1. So we have the design base shear. So for the design base shear, we have these four equations here that we will be using. Okay, so this is now the design base shear. So this is now the design base shear, which is CVI divided by RT times W, and it must not exceed this value. So if this is not, I mean, if it cannot exceed this value, it means that this is the maximum base shear. And it should not be less than this value, so meaning that this is now the minimum base shear. So after designing, or I mean, after solving for the design base shear, you will now be comparing it with this one and this one. So for example, that the design base shear is higher than the maximum base shear, it means that the base shear that you will be making use is, of course, this value. And if it is lower than the minimum, it means that the governing value is to be this value. But another thing here, so in addition, so as you can see at the bottom portion of your screen, in addition for seismic zone 4, the total base shear shall also not be less than the following. So we also have this one, which is also the minimum. So, minimum. So, that is if your building is located on seismic zone 4. So, we will be discussing about that later on. Okay, so in order for you to make use of all of these 
let's say, um, equations, you must need, of course, to know what is CVI, RTW, CAIW, CA, NV, and etc. So these are um, the parameters that we must first solve. So after solving for all of this, we can now solve for the Bezier itself. So I, so for I, I is equal to or I stands for the importance factor. And it is basically a factor to show the importance. I mean, how important a certain structure is. So, it is given in table 208-1 or that is on page 2-185 of your NSCP. So, it is dependent upon what kind of occupancy the building will be having. So, for example, that it is a hospital. And as you know, hospital is an essential facility. So, your seismic importance factor or the value of I will now be equal to 1.5. So, if let's say it houses toxic wastes, or let's say that it is a hazardous facility. So when we say hazardous facility, so these buildings cannot be destroyed because of course it is hazardous. So with that, guys, if your let's say the building that you are designing is a hazardous facility, the seismic importance factor that you will be using would be 1.25. So if it is neither 1.5 or if it is neither essential facility nor hazardous, the seismic importance factor that we will be using will be 1.0. May that be a special occupancy structure, a standard occupancy structure, or a miscellaneous structure. So in order for you to know what are the inclusives of these occupancy categories, just go to table 103-1 for the occupancy category listing. So it is in that table wherein you can see um, if your building or if your if the structure that you are um, designing will fall on these occupancy categories. Okay, so that is it for importance factor. So we have already um, discussed about importance factor. Okay, so what about for the weight of the structure? So that is um, self-explanatory and that, that is the weight of the structure or the total dead load. So let's say that this can be also known as, so also known as total dead load of whole of the structure. Then we also have the overstrength factor. So for the overstrength factor, we can make use of this particular table. So this is the factor R or this is the response of the building on B shear. So let's say that you want to design a certain structure of reinforced concrete that is special moment resisting then it means that the value of R that you will be using would be 8.5. So this can be seen in table 208-11a, and that's if you are designing a concrete one. And if you are designing steel, value for R can be seen on table 208-11b. So this is for steel. So for example, that you want to design a light framed wall system using flat strap bracing, it means that the value for R that you will be using would be 2.8 so simple okay so we already have the value for i the value for w and the value for r so what is the near source factor so where do we need the near source factor actually we need them here and of course in cv so why cv okay so for the seismic coefficients let us first discuss about those before going to the near source factor so for the Seismic coefficients CV and CA, it can be seen on these pages. So we have page 2-207, table 208-7, and table 208-8. Okay, these are the value for CA and these are the value for CV. So these values are dependent upon the soil profile type and the seismic zone. So for the soil profile type, we can um, see this table here and it is dependent upon what kind of soil the building is resting upon. So in other words, before you can design the structure, you must first get the consultation of the geotechnical engineer to assess if the structure will be resting on a hard ground. So on, on a hard rock, a rock a very dense soil or soft rock, and etc. So these are the soil profile types so going back here so that i mean those are the values or those are 
this parameter. So, from SA up until SF and for SA up until SF. So, once again, it is dependent upon the shear wave velocity or descriptively speaking, it may either be a hard rock, rock, very dense soil, or etc. Okay, so once again, those are the soil profile types. But what about for seismic zone? So as you can see, we have two columns here. So 0.2 and 0 0.4. 0.2 and 0.4. So the seismic zone factors is if the building is located on zone 2, Z is equal to 0 0.2. If the zone or the seismic zone is located on seismic zone 4, it means that Z is equal to 0 0.4. So how can we know? If the building is zone 2 or zone 4. So we have this map on the National Structural Code of the Philippines. So suppose that, let's say, the building that you are um, erecting or you are designing will be located in Luzon or in this part of Luzon. It means that it is located in zone 4. And let's say that the building that you are designing is to be resting in Palawan. It means that it is located in zone 2. So we only have two zones here in the Philippines, namely zone 4 and zone 2. And it is divided by this, of course, dividing line. Okay, so going back here, so we already have zone 2 and zone 4. But let's say that if you are designing a certain structure in zone 4, so you would now be making use of these columns for zone 4, of course. And as you can see, this says 0.32 NA. So what does NA stand for? Okay, so NA stands for the nearest source factor and it can be seen on table 208-5 and 208-6 on section 208.4.4.3 or the seismic zone for near source factor. So if the structure that you will be designing is located in seismic zone 4, you must first check these tables. So these are the values for NA and these are the values for NV. And as you can see that these values is dependent upon the nearest fault line or the closest distance to the known seismic source. So what is a fault line? So a fault line is, let's say, the rupture on the Earth's surface that is um, commonly where, uh, let's say, earthquakes will come from. Okay, so let's say that we will be designing a certain structure that is located in Bonifacio Street in Baguio City. So it is located at this part. So the nearest fault line or the nearest um, seismic source will be located 7.6 kilometers from it, which is basically at this line. So that line or that fault is what we would be calling the Tubao Fault. So, 7.6 kilometers. So, going back to this table, so we will now be checking here where 7.6 years is. So, if it is less than or equal to 5 kilometers, you will be making use of 1.2 or 1.0. And if it is greater than 10 kilometers, you will now be making use of 1.0. So, since 7.6 is in between 5 kilometers and 10 kilometers, so it means that it is neither 1.2 or 1.0 or 1.0 or 1.0. It means that it is somewhere in between. So 7.6 is somewhere in between 5 kilometers and 10 kilometers. And with that, we must interpolate first. So we will be interpolating um, between these particular values here if it is located or if it is a seismic source type. But what is seismic source type in the first place? So we can go to this table here. So let me erase this first. So your seismic source type is dependent upon the maximum moment magnitude that the fault line can produce. So if the fault line or the fault line that is nearest to your structure can produce a magnitude between 7.0 and 8.4, it means that it is a seismic source type A. So if, let's say that that fault line can produce a magnitude between 6.5 and 7.0, it means that you will be making use of seismic source type B. And if, let's say that fault line can only produce less than 6.5, it means that that is seismic source type C. 
So going back to this example, according to Phil Vox, the Tobau fault shakes in magnitude 7.2. So with that being taken into consideration, we can now say that Tobau fault is a fault that is, I mean, that can produce 7.2 magnitude and thus it is, I mean, it can be said that it is a seismic source type A. So in this one here, so A, so it means that the values that we will be interpolating would be 1.2 and 1.0. So for example, that the seismic source type is B. So you will be interpolating 1.0 and 1.0 and with that being taken into consideration, it is automatically taken that the near source factor here would also be equal to 1.0 because interpolating 1 and 1 will also equate to 1. So we will be having an example um, computation for interpolation in the next video. So in this video, I will just be showing you the introduction of it. So same is true with the near source factor NV. So for the uh, near source factor NV, it is also dependent upon the seismic source type and how far it is to the nearest fault line. So that is for NA and NV. So going back to our equation here, so NV is also discussed as well as for CV and CA. So check. So for the structural period or structure period, so that is basically the time for every vibration of the building. And it can actually be solved using two ways. So it can be solved using method A of section 208.5.2.2 or method B. So this is in page P2-215. So for method A, so you would just be making use of this equation, whereas T is equal to CT times HN raised to 3 fourths. So as for CT, it may either be 0 0.0853 if you are designing a steel moment resisting frame, 0 0.0731 if you are designing a reinforced concrete moment resisting frame, and eccentrically braced frames, or 0 0.0488 for all other buildings. So alternatively, you can also so solve for the value for CT in making use of this equation. And there, AC is this equation. So this is just for method A. So if you do not want to make use of method A, you can also make use of method B. But disclaimer and spoiler alert, that method A is a lot easier than method B. So in... Uh, this series of videos, we will be making use of method A as a reference and maybe sometime later on, I would also be posting a video on how we would be solving for the structure using method B. Okay, so that is for the structure and going back once again to our equation. So we already have the value for T. So once that you have already solved for all of these values on the right, so substitute all of this to this equation, to this equation, and to this equation. And for example, that your structure is located in zone 4, you will also be comparing it with this equation. Okay, so that is it for the introduction video. And for the next video, we will now be solving for an example problem. So there.